Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. For a primer on these Ethiopian characters, newcomers may start with the prologue by Manuel de Goes. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit Ethiopia.com. That's U T H I O P I A dot com. Oh, wise is the bearded vulture that precipitates skulls from the heavens to partake of the brains contained within. And may we too learn to suck the juices from the bones discarded by the profligate. The Apocrypha of Zereacob. Theodros. K. The peoples of the book have a marked inclination for repetitions, which are at times tragic and at times farcical. This is how their books, while they do assist in nurturing their seed, condemn them to fumble along lines that never seem to be provided with a full stop. The Ethiopians, who have a liking for writings, have lived this modus operandi for many a century. Theodoros, or Todros, of the Second Coming, the bearer of Christ, crowned emperor by his own volition, granted his person this regal name for its purely Abyssinian prophetic bearing. The very short rule at the beginning of the 15th century of Theodorus I, an elder brother of the Emperor Zedayakob, left behind the glowing memory of having been a golden epoch. Legend therefore held that the coming of a second righteous Theodorus would usher in an era of plenty for all. Theodros II was born Kassa, compensation. His not having a patronymic does not allow to believe that he did not have a father, as many slyly speculated, but rather that this father must have been rather insignificant. So Kassa Theodros scoured everywhere and in everything that he undertook for this father, seeking what could be his reimbursement. Later on, Theodros was to become very thin-skinned about these matters and was inclined to lop off the heads of those who murmured biliously that his mother had sold the bitter draught called Koso in the Gondar marketplace. His uncle, the Dizjazmach Wukil, was the ruler of the province of Quara until his opportune death when Theodros who was still in these times Kassa, had just cleared his 18th year and was a hothead. Later on, Theodoros, seeking ever more the salve of legitimacy for the worm of doubt that gnawed at his insides, sought to graft himself onto the Solomonic bloodline. In these times, the Gondorine sluggard kings sat idly in their stone keeps while their nominal fiefdoms rose against one another with impunity. Theodros Kassa was able to ascertain that his father had been a runaway sibling of the Emperor Johannes. However, as this father had died a premature death of poison, he had not been able to recognize his son Kassa, who had thus been hewn from the family tree Theodoros sought a destiny for himself. He had the royal magus construe in the compute of David a messianic future for himself and for Ethiopia. Tatek, Tatek, they call him. Kasa, Kasa, his rider, next year in Jerusalem, was the ditty that flowered on the lips of the Abyssinian populace. Men of war in Ethiopia are often affectionately known by the name of their favorite steed and Tatek was Kassa's best-loved mount. Kassa went to war against all of the Mesafint warlords. This was the end 
of the era of the judges, or epoch of princes, the period between the 18th and 19th centuries during which the sluggard kings ruled only in name, while in the provinces each race fought for himself, and brother killed brother throughout the kingdoms. Kassa was gutsy, as well as an adroit handler of men, and as such he fostered both ferocity and loyalty in his troops. Each new victory was a fulfillment of the prophecy, Oh, beware Jerusalem, and the once rickety child, his mother administers him too many of her own potions, his detractors had at first sniggered, had grown now into a striking man with a high forehead and aquiline features. On the 18th of Hadar, 1855, having vanquished the Ras Wube of Semyon, who so happened to be both a rival to the imperial throne as well as his father-in-law, Kassa at last purged his name in the Dereski church, which the Ras, Wube, had erected specially, albeit for his own enthronement. The church bell, brought at great pains from the French city of Strasbourg by his father-in-law, rang on the fly. Kassa, the son of a Koso troder, was no more, and buried away with him past the ear of the judges. Long live Theodoros, king of kings of Ethiopia. Jerusalem should start reinforcing those walls in earnest. The rule of Theodoros was at first good for all, save for his enemies and for brigands. Theodoros invoked an Abyssinian renaissance. He spoke of a prosperous kingdom united by peaceful commerce. He engaged European advisers who extolled to the king the need for taxes, roads, and the advantages of a standing army. For in all of Abyssinia there could not be found even one fair weather track in those times, and soldiers were bandits provided with a license to plunder. As Theodros was shown blueprints of railway lines and of the modern cities he would surely build, he began to give credence to the tales his troops sung when they were merry on mead. These songs boasted that he, Theodros, would assuredly cast the Turk out of the Holy Land. The emperor was at the time still sound of mind, and he listened to recriminations with a patient ear. His bosom friend, Walter Plowden, a subject of Her British Majesty, advised him well in all matters. Plowden was waylaid by Shifta on the way back from Tanna, and shortly after this tragedy perished Theodros's beloved consort, Queen Turuwark Wube. One cannot say that his character altered from one day, suddenly, to the next. The Theodros had always been inclined to severity, yet there appeared a seismic shift in the king's conduct. The craftsmen he had invaded to his court from Switzerland and Scotland to cast cannons were placed in leg irons. He began to commit many an act of senseless violence, such as tossing trussed up prisoners by the dozen from the heights of the cliffs of Magdala and burning captives alive in their huts. The emperor appeared on the first page of the London newspapers day after day. An English draftsman tasked with providing a noble-looking Abyssinian king. There is no photograph of the emperor. Did so. This line drawing is today found on countless murals throughout Ethiopia, so that what was a semblance has now become a true remembrance. A formidable force composed of 40 elephants as well as 40,000 mules and 13,000 troops of the Imperial Indian Army sailed from Bombay under the leadership of General Napier. Thereafter, Lord Napier of Magdala. The end is near, approaching fast for the bearer of Christ. One by one, his former allies forsake him. The way is open for the British and Indian troops. 
the Sebastopol cannon, a monstrosity cast by the hostages under duress, will not shoot even once, and the mountain fastness is stormed in a day, such as in a parade by the Bombay army of Her Majesty. There are even press correspondents embedded with the troops. And it is Stanley, yes, that Stanley, as you presume, who, brazenly joining the assault on the last plateau in the company of two Irish soldiers, witnesses the suicide of the cornered emperor, who shoots himself with a bullet to the head fired from the gun that had been given him as testimony of our friendship by Queen Victoria herself at the beginning of his mannerly rule. If Theodoros abysmally failed in all he endeavoured, his name and reputation, inflated by the Derg era textbooks in an attempt to dissolve the memory of Menelik and Haile Selassie, looms large in Ethiopia to this day, and an English artist's figment is printed on t-shirts and bar murals all over the country. Compensation enough? Thank mm-hmm. you.